Welcome to Top Nat Education, where you get a chapter summary of a classic novel in less time than it takes you to walk to class. Today we'll be talking about Catcher in the Rye, Chapter 11. Outside in the lobby of the Lavender Room, Holden begins to think about Jane Gallagher again. If you recall, Jane was the one who had the date with Holden's roommate Stradladder in a previous chapter. Holden remembers how he and Jane met. Her dog used to pee on his lawn, and he recalls other seemingly random memories about her. He describes her as not, quote, strictly beautiful. Here's the full quote. I wouldn't exactly describe her as strictly beautiful. She knocked me out, though. She was sort of muckle-mouthed. I mean, when she was talking and she got excited about something, her mouth sort of went in 50 different directions. Her lips and all. That killed me. And she never really closed it all the way. Her mouth. The more Holden describes Jane, the more we realize that he is actually in love with her. He remembers so many shared memories with her, including how she plays checkers, how bad she was at golf, the car her parents drove, etc. He tells the story of, quote, the only time old Jane and I ever got close to necking, end quote. In the story, they're playing checkers, and Jane's booze hound stepfather comes out and hassles her because he can't find his cigarettes. Jane refuses to even acknowledge him, and he gets mad and storms off. She begins to cry, a tear splashing dramatically on the checkerboard. It's clear that Jane isn't being molested or anything like that, but her life is imperfect and her family is a big part of it, just like Holden's. Holden recognizes her sadness and he holds her. He starts to kiss her all over, her neck, her head, her ears, but she won't let him kiss her mouth. Then they unclench and go see a movie. This is a critical moment. Holden is so sad and lonely and he's found someone else like him out there in the storm. It's romantic and they're providing a lot of comfort to each other, but it's not sexual. He's even shown Jane Alley's baseball mitt. In a way, this moment of comfort is much more intimate than a kiss would be anyhow. Holden, being young and confused, can't verbalize this. He remains unable to differentiate between love, intimacy, and lust, calling it, quote, close to necking. This is the same mistake he made with being practically in love with the blonde on the dance floor of the lavender room. Make no mistake, Holden is truly in love with Jane, and she's a key figure in the novel. If he's ever going to grow up in a healthy way, it won't be by hooking up with women like Faith Cavendish or Ernie's mom on the train or the three girls on the dance floor. It will be by sharing and expressing his feelings with Jane. Of course, he's too afraid to actually call her. He begins to grow depressed. He returns to his hotel room, but there's no one fun to watch through the window, so he catches a cab to another nightclub called Ernie's. Ernie is a piano player and Holden, and by proxy, Salinger, take another shot at fake consumer art. This time Holden is mad at Ernie for being too showy while he plays the piano. Holden explains that sometimes he feels like turning Ernie's piano over because he's frustrated by what a snob Ernie is. Holden used to go to the bar fairly often with DB, his older brother, who is himself another symbol of fake commercialized art. A quick word on that. Salinger is writing at a time when art is moving from an authentic expression of self to a consumer business. This is the reason he hates the movies, because they're the ultimate symbol of commercial pop art. In fact, if Salinger had lived long enough, he would have been horrified by things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe with its awesome spectacle and relative absence of genuine human emotion. Way back in 1955, Salinger was already acknowledging this shift in artistic principles. He was already seeing the future. It's an ironic fight for someone who's sold millions and millions of copies of a single book, but it certainly explains why he quit writing publicly shortly after Catcher in the Rye. It's one thing to complain about commercial art, it's another thing to put your money where your mouth is and completely stop doing the thing you're really good at because too many people are enjoying it for what you consider to be the wrong reasons. That's it for chapter 11, it's a short one. Get to class.